And with us, continuing our discussion on hurricanes today, is Professor Jay Baker from the FSU Geography Department, who's also a hurricane expert, who directed a recent national conference on hurricanes and coastal storms. And we're going to discuss appropriate procedures for emergency situations and hurricanes in general. Welcome to the program, Jay. Thank you. First of all, why do hurricanes have girls' names? I noticed this year they've changed that, but why do they start out having girls' names? The notion was that uh, Hurricanes are things that are very difficult to predict the behavior of, mm -hmm. and uh, they can be very destructive and furious and so forth, and uh, some people liken that to, to, to the behavior of a female. So that's, uh, that's the way it got started. And now why do we have gentlemen's names as well? I think that's a remnant of the uh, women's movement, the feminist movement. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Okay. How did you first get interested in hurricanes yourself? Well, I started out as a, as a, a physical scientist. Uh, uh -huh study a little bit of climatology and, and uh, meteorology and so forth, and eventually be, got interested in, in some of the behavioral aspects of this, uh, how people respond to, to natural events. And uh, hurricanes uh, are certainly one of the sorts of natural hazards in this area that we have the certain, should have the most interest in. Okay, now you did a study, did you not, after Eloise in 1975? Yeah, uh, this is uh, sponsored by the Florida Sea Grant Program. Mm -hmm. uh, after the storm, there have been about four of these since 1961, where researchers go into a stricken area and interview people uh, who were there at the time that the, that the hurricane occurred and the warnings were received and so forth. Try, try to find something out about how people monitor the, be the, the information that they're being given about a storm, how they respond to warnings, whether the, they had difficulty evacuating, difficulty evacuating, and so forth. Okay, now Eloise went ashore in between Panama City and Fort Walton Beach, is that right? That's right. And during your study, who did you find that left and who didn't during that storm? Well, fortunately, the, the people in the most risky areas were the ones who left uh, in the greatest numbers. About 80% of the people, or maybe it was 89% of the people, who lived in the, along the, the front edge of the beach, they were in about three blocks of the shoreline. Uh, about 80% of them evacuated when they were given the warning in slightly less risky areas along the banks of bayous and bays in the Panama City area, about uh, 54 to 56% of the people evacuated. Further inland, where the main problem was just wind, then less than 50% left. But the most, most encouraging thing is that the people at the greatest risk were the people who, who left. Other than that, it's difficult to predict who's mm -hmm. going to evacuate. Who's not. Okay, we've got some slides here. Let's take a look now at our first slide. What have we got a picture of there, Jay? The first slide just shows the sort of destruction that, that can occur along the beachfront with a hurricane. Uh, the, the sorts of elements here are not just the wind, but the wave action of a process called scour. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if structures aren't built with pilings that go deep down into the sand, uh, the, the, and the area is inundated by the storm surge and then scour the wave action underneath the, the, uh, the structure can cause it to collapse. The next slide shows an apartment complex in Patch Christian, Mississippi. It's a Richard Lou apartment complex. It's a, a three-story apartment, uh, typical of many that you find in Tallahassee, actually. How uh, far from the coast is this? Well, it's uh, probably less than, than 200 yards from the coast, but there's a, a beach in front of it. There's a six-foot seawall. There's a four-lane highway in front of it. So actually, it's probably uh, at least 10 or 12 feet in elevation above mean sea level. This shows the same apartment complex after Hurricane Camille, completely obliterated by the storm surge. Now, this was the the area of the peak storm surge, about a 20 to 20, 20 to 25 feet of water, uh, and then waves on top of that, which just completely wiped the structure off the foundation. There was a hurricane party uh, being held in the Richfield apartment complex. Let's hold on this slide for one moment. Now, this is the biggest point I think we can drive across to the viewer, that when you're told to evacuate, especially along the waterfront, you should evacuate. Exactly. There's no need to have a hurricane party if you can't be around to enjoy the next day, right? Now, people died in this apartment complex, is that correct? I think there were about 19 people who died in there. Okay, so when the people tell you to go, folks, go, that's the point of these last two slides. And what have we got here? This is a mobile home, which was, was turned over by a hurricane. Uh, now, Florida has a uh, mobile home tie-down law, which requires that they be anchored, but uh, you should still evacuate or relocate from a mobile home, even if you think that it's safely tied down. They're just not built to, to be able to withstand the strong hurricane force winds, especially some of the gusts that occur. Mm -hmm. The present slide shows uh, a shrimp fleet, which was damaged in Texas in Corpus Christi. 
in a hurricane there several years ago. And this just shows the sorts of, uh, you know, the, the, these lar relatively large boats were simply piled up by the wind uh, and then pushed aground. The final slide shows, uh, it just illustrates the fact that you should get away from windows. Even if you're in a structure which is removed from storm surge and, it, and it, the, the structure itself is going to be able to withstand the wind, you can still have a tremendous amount of, of glass breakage and so forth. So you should uh, either try to board up the windows, and even if you do, uh, are able to do this, do that, and get an interior part of the house. What about masking tape? Everybody runs out and buys masking tape. Masking tape can help. The idea there is uh, if, if the window is broken, at least the, the, the shards of glass don't fly all over the room. And let me ask you this. If people want some information, they, of course, can get it from either the Weather Bureau out at the airport or from the civil defense, and all they have to do is drop by either of those locations and the information is available free, is that correct? That's right. They, I would advise that. There, there are a number of things that people can do, uh, and the sorts of things that they should be doing right now is seeking information about mm -hmm. hurricanes, list of hurricane safety rules, and information about storm surge and winds and so forth, and that's available from the sorts of places that you mentioned. Okay, we were talking with Shorty earlier about the fact that everybody should have a battery-operated radio because of the power outages. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they can also keep tuned to NOAA Weather Radio if they have which band on the radio? It's called a public service band. And, of course, you can also pick up inexpensive weather radios at various locations around town that are operated on batteries, and they don't cost much, maybe 888 on sale, and I suppose maybe up to 1795 off sale. So. It's a good investment to have it, especially during a hurricane, because you've got to keep in tune with somebody, and with the power outages, you need a battery-operated radio, is what it boils down to. Now, I think a lot of people should be aware that you should fill up with gas, because when the power outages go, the gas pumps don't work, right? Well, that's true, and, and it should probably be done, actually, during the watch period, at uh -huh. least, uh, 36 hours before uh, you've even been told that a storm is going to hit your area as a precautionary measure. Not only because you may want to, you may need the gasoline afterwards, but so that you will be able to evacuate uh, and, and seek safety uh, and have gas in your car to get there if a warning is actually given and, and you have to evacuate if you're in a clear. You know, a lot of people like to plot hurricanes, and there are hurricane tracking charts out, and I think a lot of people might run into a problem there because as they watch the progress of the hurricane on their tracking chart, they're just dealing with dots. And a hurricane, of course, encompasses such a large area. This is true. And it goes outside your dots on your tracking chart. So don't get caught up in tracking a hurricane and think, well, here's the little dot representing the hurricane because it goes out beyond that dot, and that's something you should be aware of. Give, give, uh, Dan, given the, the scale of most tracking charts, if, if someone will take a, about a, qu a quarter and put a piece of scotch tape on the uh, on the back of it and loop it around so that the quarter can stick to the tracking chart and move that. It will give them a better indication okay. of the area that... That's great. We're running out of time, Jay. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you learned